Now, to discuss that further, we're joined by head of the international... I'm very sorry. We're joined by Marcus Papadopoulos, historian and political analyst and author, who's joining us from London, and also Mr. John Stepling, author and commentator from Norway. Let's begin with Mr. Papadopoulos. It sounds like a serious warning from Russia, doesn't it, about the U.S. taking a risk of becoming a direct party to the war with its nonstop flow of destructive weapons to Ukraine. How serious do you see this threat? Well, it should be said, first of all, that there is no tangible evidence to demonstrate that the HIMARS are having an adverse impact on the ability of the Russian military to prosecute its campaign in Ukraine. Indeed, for the HIMARS to have a relatively significant role in the war in Ukraine, the Ukrainian armed forces would have to be in receipt of hundreds of the systems. But even then, the harsh reality for Zelensky and his government in Kiev is that the Ukrainian armed forces are being outled, outmaneuvered, outgunned, outmanned, and outfinanced by the Russians. Anyone who is of the impression that either Ukraine can win this war or can achieve a stalemate quite simply is deluded. And I suspect deluded because they are exposing themselves on a daily basis to the grotesque deceit emanating from Western mainstream media. Now, regarding the role of America in this war, from day one of the Russian military's campaign in Ukraine, the Americans have been a party to the conflict. A substantial amount of the weaponry which has been employed by the Ukrainian army, either against Russian servicemen or against Russian civilians in, for example, the city of Belgorod, is of American origin. Therefore, the argument that America is becoming more and more involved in this conflict is, in my opinion, a peculiar one. But the most important reality in all of this is the following. The high commands of Russia and America and the commands of the nuclear forces of Russia and America are in daily contact with each other. And that is absolutely imperative for preventing a conflict, a direct conflict between America and Russia. Now, that reality is not something you will hear about from Western mainstream media, simply because that, in the views of Western mainstream journalists, is not a very exciting uh, news story. Western mainstream media, people in Britain and America, for example, to believe that a nuclear Armageddon between America and Russia is imminent, when the reality is that the Americans and the Russians, despite what is happening in Ukraine, remain in direct contact with each other as they have since the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1962. Okay, so Mr. Stapling, there is also a very uh, sensitive issue of the nuclear power plant in Ukraine. The IAEA chief says the agency's inspectors have been giving unlimited access to the nuclear plant and despite Ukraine's insistence that Russians have distorted facts and evidence, uh, how concerned uh, should we be about the likelihood of a nuclear disaster from that facility? Well, I think it's a concern, certainly, but um, what, um, what Marcus said, all of what Marcus said is exactly right. Um, it, it, it's important to emphasize that Western media has, has become simply a propaganda machine. I mean, the distance between reality in Ukraine and what Western media reports is, is gigantic. Uh, the, you, the Western public is, if they simply read the mainstream press in the U.S. and U.K. and actually much of Europe, 
is going to have a very different picture of what's going on in Ukraine than, than what is actually happening there. Um, the, the other thing that, you know, the Biden just this week and Congress, have, you know, rubber stamped, I think, something like another several billion dollars worth of weapons going to Ukraine. Uh, much of this weaponry is ending up in the black market. Uh, there have been numerous reports of, of the, you know, the plundering of, of aid and weaponry to Ukraine by, by this kind of gangster regime in Kiev. It's a, a profoundly corrupt government, and everybody knows this. The United States knows it, but that hasn't stopped them because, you know, the defense industry is the number one industry in the world, and they make enormous profits from this. Um, I'm not worried. Um, as Marcus said, I'm not worried either about a you know nuclear Armageddon. I mean, one always worries, but but I think there are saner minds involved um, than the people in the White House uh, and and in in Kiev. And and Russia has been actually extraordinarily restrained in in their responses to these provocations. The Russian ambassador to the U.S. yesterday said the U.S. simply continues to pour oil on the fire. And it's true, the U.S. has rejected every single effort at some sort of settlement or peace agreement or cessation of aggression. They have undermined everything. And, and they provoked this war, they wanted this war, they continue to want this war. And it's unwinnable. They're not going to win. Ukraine has suffered just this week massive, massive numbers of casualties. Uh, but you don't hear a word about that in the Western press. So, uh, you know, Ukraine may keep getting weapons, but they are running out of soldiers. Uh, and, and meanwhile, the U.S., you know, domestically is suffering increased unrest, unprecedented homelessness, unemployment. Um, there, you know, now there is a mem going around about, a, you know, upcoming civil war, but it's not all that far-fetched. There is extraordinary... Um, dissatisfaction with, with Biden, with the direction of U.S. foreign policy, the direction of U.S. domestic policy. Biden's approval ratings are something like 30 percent. I mean, that's, that's very, very low. And then he gave a, a very menacing and kind of lurid um, uh, speech, stage-managed speech against a red backdrop the other night um, that, that, you know, uh, suggested a kind of a Nazi-like um, uh, stage decor. Uh, it's all very strange. His press secretary increasingly makes provocative comments. So, so the leadership in the U.S. just increasingly feels unhinged and and disoriented. And um, and Russia, as I say, has been very restrained. And and this entire this entire conflict. Um, can be laid at the feet of the U.S. So the, the reports about the nuclear facility are, you know, it's hard to tweeze apart fact from fiction, and certainly it's impossible if you're reading simply the Western press. But, but I don't think it's a, it's a significant issue right at the moment. Um, the U.S. is going to continue to pour weapons into Ukraine. They're going to get sold on the black market. Ukraine can't win this conflict. They, they have suffered massive casualties already. Um, they are conscripting anybody and everybody to fight, and, um, uh, it, you know, it's a hopeless situation for them. And what, how much longer that can continue is, is an interesting question, because, as I say, they are, they are running out of soldiers. Uh, so, Mr. Papadopoulos, how do you think the energy war with Europe will uh, finally pan out. Do you believe that Russia's refusal, refusal to resume gas delivery to Germany at the end of the three-day stoppage of repairs has anything to do with the G7 countries' price cap on Russian oil? Well, we have already heard uh, a few hours ago that gas supplies from Russia to Germany via Nord Stream 1 is in full flow again. So that completely um, refutes the uh, arguments put out by Western politicians and Western mainstream journalists this week that the Russians were deliberately um, withholding supplies of natural gas to Germany via Nord Stream 1. But what is abundantly clear is that a catastrophic situation 
for Europe looms on the horizon. And that is the result um, completely of Western policy makers. This is not because of Russia, no. This is a result of the long-term effects of privatization in the West, the results of disastrous lockdowns for Western economies, and also the disastrous effects of the West having declared an economic war against the Russian Federation. Russia is one of the main suppliers in the world of energy and of foodstuffs. Therefore, Russia cannot be excluded from the world. Russia has never been excluded um, in the world by Western policymakers hundreds of years ago, though they never attempted to do so like their counterparts are doing today. So the ordinary man and woman in Europe, which very much includes Britain as well, is facing a horrific situation on the horizon for them. But as I said, that is, on a, that is a result of the effects of privatization, the effects of lockdowns, and the effects of the economic war that the West is prosecuting against Russia. But the Western ruling elites, by which I mean the monarchies in the West, the aristocracies in the West, and the business elites, and the banking elites, and the and the uh, uh, the media elites will not be harmed one bit whatsoever by the catastrophe which looms on the horizon for Europe. Why? Because these people are either millionaires or multi-millionaires or billionaires, and they care nothing for the welfare of their ordinary people. Indeed, the monarchies and aristocracies of Europe only care for their own families, for their own bloodlines. These people will remain warm and safe and secure in their palaces and castles and mansions and manors, whilst ordinary people in, in Europe, including in Britain, will either perish because of exposure to the cold elements or will fall into poverty or will, to, or will fall or will become homeless. And yet, the Western ruling elites have the audacity to proclaim themselves as the beacons of democracy, as the beacons of civilization, and as the beacons of Christianity. Well, I tell you from now, they are none of those things whatsoever. Okay, Mr. Papadopoulos, let's ask the last question from Mr. Sepling. We've heard about Iran's foreign minister delivering a peace initiative from an unnamed European leader to Russia. How do you see the possibility of Western support for the Ukraine war waning in light of the massive energy crisis that they're facing ahead of winter? The, the the crisis, and, and Marcus is right about this too, the crisis has is, is been created by the West. You have to also bear in mind that, that the, the, the lockdown policies, which was a, a retail apocalypse in the West, certainly in the United States, um, it was the destruction, now we're seeing the destruction of the agricultural sector with, with what's happening in the Netherlands, the farmer protests in the Netherlands, Germany, um, in Italy, people are tearing up their energy bills and burning them in public displays of protest because the bills are unpayable, they're so exorbitant. And this is just the beginning of the cold season. We haven't gotten into winter yet. It's going to be devastating across Europe if things continue as they are. Uh, the policies are irrational. Connected to this is the, the World Economic Forum, the so-called Great Reset. Uh, all under cover of, of climate concerns or green capitalism. Um, there's various excuses, but, but we saw from, from 2016 on under Obama the transference of wealth to the top 1 or 2 percent, and that's nearly complete now. Those, those billionaire um, and multi-billionaire 1 percent people own pretty much the planet now, and they are dictating policy. We are seeing policy dictated by global NGOs um, and, and run by people like the Gates Foundation and so forth that have enormous influence, unelected billionaires that, that in 
to an extraordinary degree. Um, you know, peace initiatives, all of this is almost beside the point at this, at, at this point, because I'm not sure how to reverse the, the, the crisis that looms um, in terms of energy in Europe. Uh, it, it, it would take a massive change of course, and that's probably not going to happen because we are seeing the U.S. NATO war machine uh, controlling uh, where the money goes, and, and they don't. And, and Marcus is right; they don't care about the people. They don't care about the suffering of the people. They've never cared about the suffering of the people. Um, but it's reaching it's reaching a crisis state at this point, and. Um, and it may be intentional, for all I know. I mean, we're going to see um, some sort of, uh, you know, uh, guaranteed income or something. Who knows? But it won't be good. It's going to be the pauperization of um, the working class in Europe and North America. That, I think, is, is, um, is absolute. What the response is going to be from people is, is an open question, too. But. Um, uh, nothing is going to change in, in the short term. We're going to have to see what happens when winter comes. Thank you very much, Mr. John Stepling, author and commentator from Norway, and Marcus Papadopoulos, historian and political analyst and author from London. Thanks for sharing your thoughts and views with us on this edition of the News Review. And thanks to all of our viewers for following us.